I am a child of the 90s, and even I remember it as a weird time. The styles of clothing, the bizarre pop colors, the cassette tapes, floppy disks, and it can all be summed up with one distinct sound. Remember being on the house phone when this would destroy your eardrums? Now, it might surprise you to know that my childhood was not about watches at all. I mean, I'm sure I must have had a few digital watches, what 90s kid didn't, and quartz pieces. I remember having a swatch, but timekeeping and that just didn't interest me at that age. Youth for me was about element skateboards and full chrome molly Gary Turner BMXs. Anyway, context is everything. And when Oris reached out to me and asked if I'd like to review this year's Holstein edition World Timer, which of course I had never looked into before, the 90s nostalgia hit me in the face and I said, absolutely, because what would it be like to experience a watch from my childhood today? This was going to be a nice challenge to review, so thank you Oris for this opportunity, for reaching out and for sending the watch to me. I'm going to cut to the chase. No, this watch isn't perfect. No, this watch isn't for everyone. This is a highly subjective design that will probably only appeal to 1% of the watch fraternity. So what I want to do in this video is to look more at the creative side of watch design and how this world timer challenges that. Watch design today is a fickle thing. Brands are so focused on making models inspired from styles of the 50s, the 60s and the 70s that frankly they become formulaic at a point. And this is why I enjoy Oris so much as a manufacturer, because their style, their designs cannot be seen as formulaic. From the big crown pointer date that looks at the 1940s to the Divers 65, the late 1960s, the Chronoris from the 70s, and models like this World Timer and the Aquas, they sit in the realms of the 90s and the early 2000s, even the Calibre 400 Pro Pilot, which is a watch that looks more to the future. So the Holstein edition is a series of watches released every year from the brand, I think over the last three years, to celebrate the brand's origins and its birthday on the 1st of June. All of these watches are often limited batches and this one we're talking about today is no exception, one of 250. I would have loved to experience last year's big crown pointed date in grey, that machine is a work of art, absolutely beautiful. But what makes this year's release quite the masterclass is it's paying homage to an exact model that Oris offered back in the day, a mechanical world timer with a brilliant complication. Think of it as a travel time, one of the world's first watches that offered external pushes to jump the hours. It's easy, it's intuitive, unmistakably 90s, but it frames that almost one to one with regards to the size of the watch, the choices of finishes, the quirks. And what makes it special is that it's not beholden to anything. It's not trying to make a huge dent in the industry or create hype around itself. It's a watch that's not going to appeal to everyone, but it is an important part of the brand's history, sharing a milestone with enthusiasts, and it's worth celebrating. And that sums up the Oris Holstein edition in a few words. Before even getting the watch out of the box, the packaging was superb. Oris paid great attention to the small details using a great choice of a wooden box that has nice polished hardware. The size and the scale of the box is ideal because of course most of these end up in closets and cupboards, so it's better to keep them small as possible. And since this is an anniversary and a special edition, the Oris Bear is on display, and the use of grey as the primary colour ties it up nicely. But the watch itself, let's talk about the weirdness. I can't get it off my hand. The watch itself, let's talk about Mm. But the watch itself, let's talk about the weirdness of the world timer. Pulling straight from the bizarreness of the 90s, and we just don't see designs like these today. It's understandable because these styles aren't anywhere near as popular as others. And granted, manufacturers want their watches to sell. It's gotten to a stage now that in order to make your watches palatable, they need to follow a checklist. You know, a prescribed idea about the size, about the case finishing, about the dimensions. Is it a dive watch, pilot watch? What kind of elements does it prescribe to? Does it have a rotating bezel insert? Is it something that the masses will enjoy? This can be seriously damaging for brands because those responsible with the tasks of being creative, like me, are so limited by these constraints that there is no growth, there is no expansion. So when you aren't constrained by the brief and you're left to yourself, there is far more freedom to expand concepts. Yes, maybe these aren't perfect. Yes, maybe these could just be seen as iterations or ideations. But a watch like the World Timer can be seen as the start to something greater. So maybe with the next model, they decide to not go with the integrated lug system and choose something a bit more acceptable. Maybe the only thing they take away from the dial are the small radial concentric circles inside it. But a watch like this, in many respects, can be seen as a prototype, can be seen as an example and a testbed of new ideas. 
of explorations that may not be feasible in the future, but do offer something else. And that depth, that exploration of the art of iteration, I think is lost today. And that's why we tend to see so many designs that come across as bland, as generic, as formulaic. The watch is 36 and a half millimeters, but when you get it in hand and even on the wrist, it feels much smaller. That's partly because there is so much detail on the dial that we will explore later. There's also a lot of heft to the watch because of the semi-integrated bracelet design. It gives the piece a refined feel, no doubt. There is some good weight on the wrist. I love that there is this spaceship flying saucer quality to how this watch has been put together. It has this otherworldly Roswell look to it. It doesn't make any sense, but maybe it doesn't have to. It's actually quite 50s in the way it follows through with the bulbous shapes, the polished and rounded edges. These straight integrated lugs that jut out from the case look like they belong to the Breguet Marine. The case design with those flared crown guards and even the dial layout reminds me of the Patek Philippe Aquanaut, another watch that was designed in the 1990s. And it's not too far of a stretch to say that this watch does have an aviation theme throughout. What I also found quite fascinating is there's also a great use of modernity and current design language with this piece, the Oris Aquas bracelet and case. We notice that the outer links have that stepping to them that can only be associated with an Aquas bracelet. The flanks of the case having this kettlebell shape that splays outwards when it's on the wrist. So like I said, there is a great sense of weight and presence on the wrist. That's all down to how the bracelet has been integrated. And I must also commend the clasp on these Oris watches. It's a really simple twin trigger design that works well. Let's get to that question we've all been asking. What does this watch do? It's called a world time, but I like to think of it as a dual time. The caliber in this watch is really interesting. It's known as the 690, and I believe it uses an ETA base, but listen to the features it offers. Time and date complication. Small running seconds, a day night indicator, a dual time and instantaneous jumping hours. You simply set the small dial on the right to your home time, and you use the main dial either to mirror the home time or the time you will be setting when you're traveling. And this is all done through the pusher integration. A few clicks on it, and you move the time back or forward an hour. So it's really simple. You're getting on a plane, you have your home time set on the right-hand side, and say it's two hours ahead that you're traveling, press the plus button twice. Using this plus or minus feature, you can adjust the time in one hour increments, set the time to the place you're traveling to, and there we go. The system is incredibly intuitive because there is a day-night indicator on the right-hand side, so you don't have to touch any of that. None of that changes. Another great feature just about the complication is that as you use these jump hours, you can also adjust the date incrementally. As the hour hand passes the 12, the date will also change. I have to say that the pusher integration has been handled so well. Having it at the four o'clock and the eight o'clock position makes it such a clean and symmetrical looking design. And what I like most about it is it doesn't come across looking stylized or cartoonish. It looks very modern. And beyond the externals, it's now looking to the details of this watch. It's appreciating how much has been crammed into this dial. The diameter of it is 27 millimeters. There is lots of three-dimensionality going on, from the chapter ring that is at a sloped angle to the applied numerals. They even went further by adding machined concentric circles around these numerals. The majority of these applied elements also glow in the dark. There were many shades of blue used between the subdials and the main dial. It's a small thing to notice, but how the chapter ring has been opened to allow more space for the larger dial on the right-hand side. How there's been a great emphasis on the framing of the date window and how it's placed at the six o'clock position. The originals of these watches didn't have color matched date windows, but here we see it and it looks so good. And one of the greatest quirks about that original world time and this one is the small plus and minus on either end of the dial. Another thing that I don't think many people have picked up on is that positive with that red surround looks exactly like a Swiss flag. So it's all subliminal, and I think this watch could be best described as a subliminal design. Granted, there are some really bizarre implementations of designs, like that crown that they've used. True to the original, but it looks like something that belongs in a Lego Technic box. Those integrated lugs with this female element that allows for the strap to attach. But what cannot be taken away here is the attention to detail. Every single thing has been scrutinized, from the sharpness of the lugs to the underside of the case back. And it's also seriously impressive to think about how much is going on inside this watch, and it's only about 12 millimeters tall. Not only does it have all of these features, but it's also 50 meters waterproof with a screw down crown. The peculiarities of its design captures the time it belongs in. This is most definitely a time capsule of that era. And everything from the scale of the watch to the integration of the bracelet. You could say hands down that a watch like this would not pass today's scrutiny, user experience, testing prior to being launched. 
There is just too much about this watch that makes it polarizing for the everyday person nowadays. But I must say, it's been pretty special to experience a watch that's, you know, nearly 30 years old in design. A watch that definitely does not belong in the 2020s. And I like the fact that Oris can make these sorts of interpretations and go with these insane decisions. Ones that aren't going to speak to the broader community, but they don't care about that. They're more interested in saying, hey, look, we've made a one-to-one -one scale replica of a dual time that's relatively affordable and has a great complication that links to our heritage and our history. And you've got to give the brand props for that. I just hope that next year's Holstein edition is way less polarizing.